I'm really proud to introduce Janani Balasubramanian. Um, they're a writer of speculative fiction whose work has been presented at more than 160 stages across North America and Europe, including the Public Theater, MoMA, Red Bull Arts, and the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, most recently, Janani premiered Heisenberg, an audio augmented reality game on uncertainty and chaos at the New York Highline. Um, they're currently working on Sleeper, a dystopian trilogy about sleep, dreams, and physics, and they're also a fellow at the Public Theater, which is a two-year fellowship, I learned. Um, and also, a quick shout-out to Lambda, Lambda Literary for co-hosting tonight. Thanks so much, and please welcome Janani. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to read a little selection from a short novel I'm working on called Stargate. And then I'm going to introduce our two lovely authors this, for the evening. Um, yeah. So I'll read about five minutes and then I'll move on to the program. I am thinking of dying, he told the ocean. Then he clarified, killing myself. He plunged two feet into the sand. He could feel some of it nestle painfully within a cut on his big toe. Perhaps these were a cluster of diatoms, single-celled species of photosynthesizing algae found anywhere moist. Remarkable commercial applications. Through a scanning electron microscope, diatoms appear full of holes, disturbing since the appearance of so many holes reminds the brain of disease. In turn, the sand, possibly full of jagged diatoms, may be diseased. He pulled his feet out and visualized diseased diatoms entering his lacerated skin. Diatoms had been the answer to an unscrambling puzzle in a certain issue of the New York Times. The year was 1967. The day was sunny with a faint moon at day's end. Joanna had insisted the answer be Adam Id. As she said, the smallest possible level of the soul. She argued persistently, waffling between joke and candor. She glid the black ink to spell out Adam Id next to M-O-T-A-D-I. He did not argue back. In his mind, he wrote diatom in blue ink, smoother than her black. He never told her aloud, and they tucked the New York Times with this falsehood into his dresser drawer at Stanford University. It was smooth birch. A wet New York Times had made a black and white impression on the drawer's top surface. Faintly, Further coverage of Soviet lunar flight. The shuttle could orbit, but not land. Now he might scrub diatom with red ink and write die atom in its place. He said again to the ocean, killing myself. He sunk his feet in the sand once more, seeing whether the ocean would respond by killing him, death by diatoms. Joanna's research in 1967, her fifth year and his senior, was in partial differential equations. She had explained it thus, how to smooth micro variations out of curves. Like sanding the data, she said, first with roughage, then with finer and finer sand, and then at last with mathematical silk. There was no way to perform such calculations at scale on her own, so she worked on method and abstraction. He hoped the sand would erase the microcurvatures on the surface of his big toe, smooth and fingerprintless. The cyber people of the future, the ones who might take over jobs and social functions, could be fingerprintless. If fingerprints were a signature, he wished to have no name at all. Let the ocean slaw his rough name and feed it to a baleen whale. Harold. This name came from his adoptive grandfather, 
whose grandfather was in turn named Harold, and his. He had had another name once, but could not find it. The adoptive family came from Britain. Harold was Sileti from Northeast India. Harold's mother died giving birth. His father died of exhaustion. Harold was brought to an orphanage where his adoptive family found him, slawed his old name, and gave him Harold. His new parents moved to America, California, then New York. Now they lived in Connecticut. He emoted this story to the ocean just like this, scrubbed of micro variations into a generalized wave pattern. You have touched all shores. Maybe you have found my name on one of them. In his mind, Cerulean, he wrote partial names. The Cerulean was the color of Joanna's old worn copy of Vector Calculus. On its cover was a figure full of planar holes like a close-up diatom. At its edges, the charcoal innards frayed gray. Harold shut his eyes. The cerulean filled their extent. You're right. The past is a vast and empty screen. All phonemes I insert into my past may be false. When he opened, the cerulean appeared to flood from inside his eyelids to the ocean. Even the sand turned cerulean. What is wrong with you? Thank you. So I'm so thrilled to introduce Viet Din to you all, um, especially of, after having gotten the pleasure to read his book. Um, so Viet Din's novel, after Disasters is an intricate story of love and loss told through the eyes of four international aid workers in the wake of a life-shattering earthquake in India. Heidi Hong writes in the LA Review of Books, meticulously researched and vividly told, After Disaster is an ambitious range turner that weaves together environmental devastation, queer masculinities, and post-colonial landscapes. Din was born in Dalat, Vietnam, and grew up in Aurora, Colorado. He received his BA from John Hopkins University and his MFA from the University of Houston. Please welcome. Thank you very much uh, for that gracious introduction, and thank you very much for um, coming out, and uh, thank you for to the uh, Asian American Writers Workshop for hosting me. Um, so. I am going to read from a section early in my book, and this section follows um, Dave, who is South Asian and lives in Delhi, and he is traveling to the Gujarat area of um, India, which is in the Northwest region, which was where um, uh, the epicenter of the earthquake took place. Um, so Dave is a uh, physician, and um, he leaves Delhi um, and uh, in this section I'm going to read, he has just arrived in Bouge. It's near three in the afternoon when Dave arrives in Bouge. A young soldier ushers him and four others into a tata sumo, which normally has room for ten. The rest of the space has been given over to equipment. Dave keeps his hand on the neck-high pile of boxes next to him. Others sit folded, like letters in an envelope, to make room for supplies. Debris has choked off roads, points of exit. A caravan of sumo stretches from the army base in the heart of the city, which bears no resemblance to the city Dave visited five years ago. All around them, rubble the color of clotted cream, and amongst the rubble, darker spots, which Dave imagines are bodies, clothed, crumpled. In the car, a collective gasp. Some pray, and the remainder weep. Nurses weep. Doctors weep. Dave, however, does not weep. Both he and the city have changed irrevocably. There can be no crying over it now. As they enter, others escape. The car in front of them has been consumed by the mass of evacuees on foot. The soldier blows the horn, but no one moves. There is nowhere to go. People press their palms against the car, heads bowed. Their knuckles wrap on the windows leaving rosettes of blood. What should we do, asks the nurse. 
She reaches for the window crack, and Dave yells, Stop! They'll swarm us. She's on the verge of tears, but crosses her arms. In the box next to her, glass tinkles, the sound like ice crystals forming. Men stand behind the tailpipe and hold up both hands, mouths downturned in anguish. Why do you not stop? The car moves forward, the engine whinnying as the driver presses the pedal. How much further, Dave asks, and the soldier gestures as if waving away a mosquito. Somewhere in the distance. The nurse asks, would it be easier if we got out and walked? The driver shrugs. Triage has been set up where Bouge Civil used to stand. The peaks of the tents look like the points of skin where the stitching needle has not yet broken the surface. Speed is the key. Much of the groundwork has been prepared. The ambulatory and lucid are separate from the immobile and dazed. The unresponsive lie on the ground on blankets, and Dave moves up, the, up and down the rows. Colored rows of tape dangle from his right arm like bracelets. He holds a silver pen light and peels back each person's eyelids. He cannot look at the other wounds, not now. He stares only at their eyes. He focuses on the retina, on the iris, waiting for contraction as the beam grazes the eye. And just as quickly, he attaches a strip of tape to each person's chest, right beneath the collarbone. He does not want to use the black tape, but more and more, the situation warrants it. As the roll runs out, he attaches small pieces of the black tape along his fingers until his entire left hand is covered, a dark semaphore. The operating theater is functional nine hours after the earthquake, and even then, far too late. Limbs that might have been saved are now gangrenous, rancid, black flesh. Concussions have bled into subdural hematomas, leaving patients disoriented, unable to sit for examinations. A doctor sits with three patients in front of him in a radial pattern so that he can stitch all three in one go. He shouts, needle, I need a needle. With a surgical team in place, Dave can now perform more thorough triage with the borderline cases. The man before him has an indentation in his temple the size of a walnut. The skin is unbroken. What is your name? Dave asks. The man stands as if late for an appointment, and Dave holds his shoulders. He's a marionette. He looks 50, pockmarked with evidence of a hard life. The blank intensity of his stare reminds Dave of a taxi driver. Soldiers move the dead to make room for more living. They should, Dave thinks, keep better track, write down names, post a list. People come to the medical area searching for loved ones. They fill the air with plaintive inquiries. Are you there, Ramesh? Please answer. And push at the tents with a desperation so violent that the guard, uh, soldier guarding the tents cocks his gun on the verge of firing. Your name, Dave asks again. Still no response. Dave administers a prick test with a safety pin. He starts at the man's middle fingertip and makes his way up the hand and up the arm. Sharp or dull? No answer. He repeats the test with a chip of ice. Hot or cold? The man seems impervious to sound, light, pain, any sensation. At best, he rates a seven on the Glasgow Coma Scale, four grades away from death. The man once again tries to leave, but Dave detains him. Where do you need to go, he asks. What's so important? This man needs a CT scan, a PET scan, MRI, EEG, any number of unavailable devices. The man turns his head towards Kalputro Road. His head tilts up in a tremulous nod. His pupils contract, and for a moment, Dave thinks he's indicating a direction, someplace that he needs to be but the man's moment of clarity disappears as soon as it appears. His pupils redilate, and he turns back towards Dave. He opens his mouth, and between his lips, thick cords of mucus distend. I can't let you go, Dave says, but the man ignores Dave's insistence. He belongs out there, the man seems to say. His family awaits, be they dead or alive. Dave takes a self-adhesive label and writes as neatly as he can, Rajiv. 
if the man's being has leaked out of this indentation in his skull, the least that Dave can give him before he wanders back into nothingness is a name. Broken hands, broken legs, blunt force trauma, burst intestines, patients from the nearby villages, Anjar, Bachao, Damadka, come to Bouge. Doctors amputate mangled limbs with scissors. The hospital in Ahmabad, despite suffering damage itself, has offered to take the most severe cases, provided they survive transport. Dave must take, make decisions and make them quickly. You, who have lived a long life, will stay. You, who have not yet begun to live, will go. Then come the aftershocks. Sleepers wake, the rubble shifts ominously, and the lights sway. One falls and bursts into stars. People scream and scramble. Dave crouches low and puts his arms out to steady himself. His heart jumps. The aftershock finishes as quickly as it comes. Dave hyperventilates. His fingers and toes buzz from the excess oxygen. He feels dizzy, as if he might topple. Around him are desperate screams, a deafening cacophony. Panic is as palpable as rain. But Dave, he feels more alive than he has for a long time. The generators chug out black fumes and heat and electricity, but they also stall out and fail. The sudden darkness sends people into terrors. One soldier has been given generator duty. He patrols with a canister of petrol and a fuddle, trying to keep all of them functioning simultaneously. In this patch of night turned back into daytime, the light dries Dave's eyes. Each time he blinks, his eyelids stick to the balls. These small emergency generators aren't powerful enough to run a full refrigeration unit, so plasma is stocked in a tent walled with slabs of ice. The bladder bags grow skins of frost, and the nurses melt windows with their thumbs to uncover the type. The night brings its own cold. Dave has no other clothes than what he wears, and his sleeves are smeared with blood and lymph and who knows what else. It's impossible to keep sterile conditions. Latex gloves are scarce. He has one box, which he guards between his feet. He has been up for nearly 24 hours. While Dave was a resident, he worked 36-hour shifts, but always sneaked in a few minutes of rest. A quiet office, an unoccupied gurney, his head in his hands in a toilet stall. But he is no longer a young man, and one patient shuffles in after the next. He sets a broken arm as best he can, and the woman screams as the bones scrape against one another. Her screams meld into the others. The surgeons have no anesthesia. Don't cry, Dave says. Save your energy for breathing. He has no plaster with which to stabilize her arm. He looks around for a plank of wood, a roof tile, even cardboard. At his feet, empty packets of gauze, ankle deep. Dave summons a group of soldiers. He sends them into a nearby store to bring back pants, shirts, saris, shawls. Bandages are their first priority. Cotton only, please, he instructs them. The wounds must breathe. They shred the cloth with bayonets. The unusable clothes, rayons, polyesters, are given to those who have nothing to wear. One man has been in, had been in the bath when the earthquake struck and walks naked, dust crusting on his skin like a shell. He puts on a shirt that extends past his fingertips and pants that expose his ankles, and for these, he thanks the soldiers. Dave fashions a sling out of a pair of pantyhose for the woman with a broken arm. The jawan watching the generator stands idle. Dave calls, you, break into that chemist shop and grab supplies. The soldier, little more than a boy, should be used to taking orders. Go, Dave says, I will take the blame. He breaks the window with the butt of his rifle and emerges with a few boxes. Syringes, needles, bottles of glucose. Get medicines, Dave yells. What kind, the boy asks. All of them. Everything you can get your hands on. Dave had almost forgotten what his own voice sounded like. His shouts are a vestigial organ rediscovering its function. Quick now, he says, quick. A man barefoot approaches. He resembles a ghost who has been wandering for eternity. The lights have brought him here. People have grown inured to the night, vanishing 
vanquishing it with a flip of a switch. But now it has reconquered them. They cower before its immense power. Even Dave had forgotten how incapacitating darkness is, its unyielding hunger. To banish night, even for a moment, is to reassert humanity's dominance over nature. The man carries a girl in his arms. She dangles as limp as laundry. Please, he says, my daughter. Her name, Dave says. He tires of asking this question, a formality now. Lakshmi. Dave motions to a nearby cot, and the man places her there. The muscles in his arms tremble. He must have been carrying her for hours. Doctor, he says, please treat her first. There are others, Dave says. The screams have faded to moans, the sound a wall that threatens to crush him at any moment. Triage is almost complete. Tomorrow, Dave will find a scalpel and enter the surgical theater. There are, perhaps, lives that can be resuscitated. This girl, nine at most, dressed in a woolen jumper with her school seal stitched to the right of her heart. Perhaps she was to play some part in the India Day ceremonies. This girl cannot be saved. Please, the man says again. His voice is flat. His hopes have died with his daughter. Please examine her, he says. If she is dead, then I need to look for my wife. Go, Dave says. Go search for your wife. The man steps back into the all-consuming dark, and only later does Dave realize what he should have said. A simple, elegant statement. A response that should have bubbled up from a place that Dave can no longer recognize. He should have said, go, and I will attend to your daughter. Thank you. Um, recently, I read Annie Dillard's The Writing Life. If you've ever read it, it's a really delightful short book. Um, and uh, I was thinking about, as we were talking about, how tough it is to slog through a book sometimes, this particular scene when uh, Annie Dillard is talking to this young child who enters her studio. Uh, and she shows the kid her manuscript. Uh, and the kid asks, did you write this? Uh, and he's like really amazed that you know she could have written this huge thing. Um, but then he clarifies his actual question uh, and says, or did you type it? Uh, <laughs> by which he would be far less impressed. Um, so uh, thank you so much. I really loved that selection and that, that is one of my, uh, the most visceral scenes for me from, from the book. Um, Next, I have the pleasure of introducing Oki Sugumi, whose work I also got to read uh, this, this past week. Um, Oki Sugumi writes poetry and fiction and has a forthcoming speculative novella about giant insects, revolt, migratory time travel, oceanic feelings, and both the limits and possibilities of relations like friendship. They are the author of two chapbooks, Under Lazy, Portable Press at Yo-Yo Labs, and Smear Jelly Dreaming, A Goo Daughter and Time Travel and Friendship from the Museum of Expensive Things. Born in Seoul, South Korea, as military dictatorship ended, they currently reside in Philadelphia. Please welcome Oki. Hey, it's lovely to be here. Um, the selection I'm reading is going to be more about insect feelings and oceanic feelings. Um, <laughs> and um, there's going to be a few Korean words that are sort of translated in context, but um, just go with it. Um, OK. <clears throat> the first time the disease came to her, it was a humid summer. Her brother commandeered the hose to shoot cold water, drenching any passerby. They pushed ice cubes into their mouths. No method provided total relief. Every night the children slept on thin bamboo sheets, scratchy and cool, underneath mosquito nets which showed up as sails in their dreams, sails of ships transporting them into remote arctic caverns. They jumped into ponds and came out covered in fat leeches that left contusions on the legs. But then, forgetting, they'd jump in again as if <clears throat> they were performing a ritual, a self-baptism, emerging blessed by tiny succubae. In their delirium, they did things like chew on bark and pine resin, 
ground mystery fruit and smeared the juice on their brown arms. The smell of steaming flowers was everywhere, and it made them want to devour everything. They gathered berries and came home with only a handful, drunk with sugar, stung by jealous bees. They dove for and ate the chopped flesh of conch, lurking, lurking with an occasional hermit crab and small fish. In the evening, they harvested the remaining vegetables untouched by the vindictive neighborhood dogs, their hands fragrant with wild garlic and then with mint. This is how they lived, automatic with madness, forgetting easily. That was the summer of ecological bloom. The oak trees thickened with yellow caterpillars. They dripped off the trees. The ground splattered with yellow mush, which dried into stains, all layered over by chewed on oak leaves, bitten green over bitten green. That the caterpillars were numerous had to do with their dying, despite having few natural enemies. That summer, they seemed to feast on trees like flesh and maybe eat themselves. When they were there, life without them was no longer seeable. When they were gone, spaces in the trees seemed strange and without. No butterflies ever came to replace them, and the spaces they left behind were sticky. She'd gotten used to how everything moved with extra weight on it. It opened and shut differently now. And when the wind moved too freely through the branches, her eyes adjusted for the difference. Put those gooey bodies back there. One afternoon, she ran out after a sun shower to catch the last of the cool before it evaporated. Her father held out his hand and tried to hand her a memi, like a handshake. She sensed the vibrating thing, the buzz and hard wings hitting his skin. Instantly, she could see all the other memi on the island, their constant all over presence. They could all fit in his hand. They weren't there yet, but seemed to be waiting their turn, a mahogany and terrible presence, like a thousand pieces of his soul, which might as well be her soul. They were thundering in hidden places, demanding that she take responsibility for them, that every single one of them had a pair of eyes occurred to her with a shiver, that all of them might be recording her movements and taking note at her speech, or even wordlessness, aware of what made her wordless and what caused her to speak. She ran, triggering a patch of dragonflies flight into the sun while, crawling, while the crawling hornets in the sand ignored her. She was aware of how much information they were gaining then, of what may have caused her to run, where and how she ran, zigzagging to a spot between the trees, cool with moss and free for the moment. Later, she learned the English word cicada, which seemed emptied of that same proliferative magic, sounded more properly insect and science. But once you learn the word, it stays anyway, and often she woke up thinking, now a buzzing science in my mouth. The same hands were once dyed with Pung Song Ha, bright orange fingernails pressed light, tight with a mash of petals and leaves. So she knew he was once a boy, a boy running near the hills of yellow canadi of late spring, fingers still dyed with pong sung of early spring. Later she would learn words like forsythia, which did nothing to describe the country hills dotted with toasted pollen, with canadi, the dancing canadi. And later she learned the common name <clears throat> for pong sung was touch me not. Later, she would have the pongsunga press on her fingers, sometimes only the pinky drenched orange. She used plastic cling wrap and tightly wrapped scotch tape, not the leaves themselves, to cover the crushed guts of flower pulp, cutting off circulation of the blood. In that drunk summer, dripping with caterpillars and the drones of the memi, um, militarized debauchery of insects when her body was already covered in the blood sinking punctures of mosquitoes and leeches. She entered the ocean and came out with the beads upon her skin. At first, hardly noticeable. No dull pain, no itching, and no burning rash sensation, 
no drip nor pus, no real hot influx of feeling. It was a dreamy time, and the dreaming coincided with trips to the water. She hardly registered this new phenomenon, this barely physical thing, up against all that gooey. In the beginning, the welts were faint, came and went. That one summer, she thought it would never end. But autumn came, and the summer was forgot forgotten. In winter, she tried to remember what that kind of heat felt like, the heat of many invisible bodies pressing, now dormant. In spring, everything lightened, became soft with young sap. When it was summer again, she hardly remembered about the gooey, the bodily. But the bodies began to swell again, the same but more, more but then still more, still more than, ever, than even bigger. Now there were no gaps through which the gooey weight could be felt, a swelling plasma mess, rotting bodies, eating chattering bodies, eating seeing bodies, and it all began again, parent eating child to spawn ten more, children eating parents to spawn a dozen queens. If she threw it up, there would be more gooey bodies, no difference would occur. Her body was smeared with the stuff. Was it the death smear, the leftover excretions of there once were? That was how it used to be. She could barely remember. Now life and death were smeared together and new bodies sprang out from inert ones, reformed from the sweat, any moisture, any mark, any air. The welts, like bodies, began to swell. That's when she began to hide. She hid the welts from her mother, who worked as an unlicensed healer. She stole herbal salves from her marked jars, calendula cream, chamomile wax. She stuck herself with bee stings, squeezed aloe juice from plant clippings. Aren't you hot in those long sleeves? Oh, I kept getting stung. Can I see? It's OK. I already put something on it. It was a good time to hide. The vegetables and the children grew to supplement the family. The vegetables the children grew to supplement the family's food were eaten by the bodies. None left for the neighborhood dogs or for anyone to eat. The price of food went up. Her father's translation work was slowing down. Her mother had a spike in healing and body work, but then her clients feeling the pinch, promising to pay her later, and she relented. Too many couldn't go to the hospital, and she couldn't not help them. People were agitated. They started to call it a plague. They started to say something was very wrong. She was already used to hiding. She hid the fact of her hunger from her parents, gnawing on a stick or an ornament made of salty dough before she went to sleep. During the day, she chewed on sap squeezed out from trees, which made her tongue dry and her teeth dark. She ate minty leaves, medicinal plants her mom had taught her were OK to eat, pine needles. If the needles come in bunches of fives, they're edible. She didn't know where she had learned that from and didn't know if it was true, but counted them every time. She stole pinches of salt from the kitchen. Her mother made dense, hard flour biscuits. She called them hard hardtack, like she learned from her books about pirates. Her mother said, eat these and don't be hungry. And they pretended, sucking on the biscuits' dusty surfaces until they softened into something filling. There was another fullness, the swarming fullness of too much life. She felt all the bodies crowd into her, squish into all her architecture, excreting and pulsing. At first, there were superstitious rumors, fanatic whispering about cursed bodies, paranoid conjectures about spies from the future here to contaminate and cleanse the world. People huddled in old bunkers and played eschatological games. Sometimes late at night, roving gang gangs of mostly young men in hazmat suits began blasting people walking alone at night, especially the sickly, the homeless, with massive doses of repellent. Many of them died. There was an outcry. The whole thing st struck a nerve. Something is happening, people said. We need to take care of it before it gets out of control. They are wrong to do that, other people said, but they aren't wrong about the problem. The xenophobes joined, joined up with the Anthropocene profiteers. Even the anti-vaxxers, while rejecting wellnesses under his vaccines, agreed that the new policies were needed. Their dogs were being disappeared, swallowed up at night by larval hunger. Controlled citywide bug bombings began. 
While huge doses of repellent might kill a person whose body was already compromised, it did not have the desired effect on the insects. If anything, they seemed to grow more resilient. Soft-bodied insects were overruled by new regimes of the exoskeleton. Anonymous posters appeared in the street. Go back to your own time. Eradicate bugs. Symptoms were listed. The irony was that besides hunger, she was in good shape, not too fatigued, not falling ill in obvious ways. This was a known symptom. These bodies were relatively impervious to the atmosphere. It was this unusual resistance to that which afflicted everyone that gave you away. But she didn't feel like she was resisting anything and winning. It was more like she had absorbed the atmosphere. She was the atmosphere. Her body wasn't able to reject it at all. Her immunities didn't fight it. She didn't vomit. Whatever was teeming everywhere was teeming in her. So now I'm going to ask a few questions, and then you're going to ask a few questions, and uh, they will have eloquent answers about there are two texts, respectively. So, um, as I was thinking through what I wanted to ask uh, both of the authors, both of you, um, a lot of my thoughts, especially because both your works are so materially felt, uh, are about the material lives of your stories. And so both the material context uh, in your own minds, in your own inner lives, as well as the outer lives with the, uh, from which uh, your stories emerge. Uh, so if there's a theme to my questions, it's that. It's about material lives uh, and the context in which your uh, fiction is made. Um, so the first thing is a question for both of you. Um, I would love to know about what you both uh, are or were researching during the process of writing your stories. Um, both of your books have a lot of substance in every sense of the word. Um, your book has a lot of bug substance. Um, and I think we don't talk a lot about how rigorous the research in fiction often has to be, um, but it has to be seamlessly woven in, in a way. Um, so I want to know about your research process. Uh, who were you talking to? What were you reading? Uh, what were the things that sort of popped up in your lives, different kinds of unexpected knowledge uh, that came upon you uh, or are still coming upon you uh, as you work on these two novels? So, um, This is a sort of embarrassing question for me because um, I do a lot of research, but I wouldn't say it's meticulous. <laughs> um, I, I think I'm observant and um, like to think about things a lot, um, but my research tends to be a lot more like looking for things that resonate with me emotionally. Um, so I did like think a lot about, look up a lot of things about bugs and um, military research into like creating like um, little cockroaches or hummingbirds that are actually like surveillance objects and things like that. Um, but it wasn't, it wasn't totally thorough research in the way we think of research being rigorous as um, in academia or something like that, in that kind of context, but rather, I don't know, more of a, a, bro a broadly roving kind of research um, that I, is the kind of research I do for writing poetry as well. Yeah, just to uh, echo what Oki said, I think that um, writers, we research enough to understand the truth, right? We understand, to understand the truth of the situation. And then um, once, once uh, I, I guess it's sort of like plaster work, like once, once we've got enough like mortar in, we, then we just stick our own bricks in everywhere else <laughs> and, and, and smooth it out and hope it looks good, right? Hope, and we hope we've got a, a continuous wall there. Um, uh, but for my research, um, uh, there was, um, you know, doing a, uh, a lot of uh, looking at firsthand accounts of uh, of aid workers, as well as um, getting getting an opportunity to 
to travel to um, Gujarat and also do some firsthand interviews of some of the survivors. So, um, you know, I think you, you get, a, you, you research enough to get that veer of verisimilitude and, and, you know, and then you take off from there. Thanks. Um, my next question is for Viet specifically. So one thing I was thinking about as I was reading After Disasters uh, is the women in this story. Um, I became super, super curious about the women in this story. Um, so the plot itself is centering on these four men, um, but I also found myself drawn in by a few different, uh, actually several of the women in, in the story. Um, so the first uh, is Dave's wife. Um, and they've described her as entering this complicated marriage with her eyes open, um, which is a really beautiful description of uh, what's going on. Um, I was also really intrigued by Rana, um, who is this super steadfast translator who translates incredible violence. Um, and you describe her as the s stories are passing through her like ghosts. Um, but that to me was like a testament to her uh, compassion and her grit. Uh, rather than her lack of compassion. Um, and I was also super intrigued by this moment where aid workers are describing whom to give food to. And they say that if you give it to the men, they will barter it for weapons. And if you give it to the women, then the families will eat. Um, so I kind of wanted to ask another research question, but also a question about what you are thinking about as you are crafting these characters and what is this relationship you're bringing out about uh, between uh, disaster and crisis and gender um, and how these play out in the real world. So um, uh, to, to address that, that last point you made, you know, um, in research, you, you do come across these, these interesting little factoids and tidbits that you have to think, oh, th there's no way I, can't, I can let that go. And, um, you know, the, 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 um, the, the story about uh, giving food aid to the women as opposed to men was, was one of the things that you know, I, I did encounter in, in my research. Um, but overall, in, in looking at the, the women of my story specifically, um, you know, in, in the novel, even though the, uh, the narrators are men, um, I was, one of my um, interests in them was looking at um, you know, how masculinity and, and sexuality um, are, are defined and how, and how they have to um, define it for themselves. And oftentimes, you know, um, it, it's, it's defined um, in, in the binary system, right? You know, uh, you know, what is masculine is what is not feminine. Um, so, you know, um, I think that oftentimes has a tendency to sort of, um, to, um, essentialize uh, women a little too much. And even though some of the men, um, you know, have this relationship with the women, I felt it was important to, to, um, to emphasize that, no, you know, these women have their own lives and they have, have their own um, relationships and have their own, um, you know, want to define themselves as well. Um, so that was a little bit of what I was working with. Um, as I was developing uh, my female characters. What was the uh, place where you were finding the things about aid workers and gender and how they're distributing food? It was an interview? Um, luckily, at the University of Delaware, where I teach, um, we have a, a little research center called the Disaster Research Center. Okay. <laughs> and, you know, um, they, they have a lot of uh, materials there about, uh, you know, different, um, not only uh, natural disasters, but uh, you know, man-made disasters, conflicts, and and uh, how to how how people respond to those. So that's that's where I dug up a lot of these these delicious little factoids. Very serendipitous. Um, so my next question is for Oki specifically. Um, a lot of your work reminded me of Vonnegut and um, Mad Max, and as I was just listening to your selection just now of X-Men, um, and also of Vixen, the DC character, if anybody's a DC fan, anyway. Um, and I was thinking about why, uh, and I realized it was this visceral discomfort that I had with a lot of the images you write. Um, 
and you know that these are really uncomfortable landscapes and bodies uh, and things going on. Uh, like I find Mad Max really difficult to watch, um, and I find your book uh, not difficult to read in the writing sense, but in the like visceral feeling sense. Um, there are arm welts and scaly skins and mouths full of cobwebs and drought and decay and all kinds of disaster. Um, and I just want to know where it emerges from for you, this sort of unsettling feeling uh, that you want to convey. Um, I think maybe at its root, I one of the things I'm interested in thinking about is like the thinking about the body's relationship to trauma and like re-entering the body after like after experiencing trauma and like feeling all the sensations and the th and the sensations being kind of gross um, or like too felt too much um, so I think that was at the at the sort of basic levels one thing I was thinking of I mean I, I think in terms of also back to thinking about like what is research maybe is, I was, some of the experiences described are maybe inspired by like political experiences I had like in the street. And, um, and yeah, the, the feeling of like your body is not totally in control and things happen to you and, you, and your body reacts like kind of in a crisis situation. Um, and that sometimes those reactions are unexpected and sometimes Unexpected is also kind of gross. <laughs> um, I guess my last question is for both of you. What are you reading or watching or thinking about right now that we should know about? Um, well, I, I guess I, I, I'm not ashamed to admit this, but I have, I have a deep, deep love of horror movies. So um, I, I've, I've slowly been working my way through, you know, the entire Netflix horror movie category, um, you know, just, just one after the other. Um, I, I can't recommend <laughs> anything necessarily, <laughs> um, you know, because oftentimes when you watch horror movies, you know, you, you're, just, you're just watching them for the moments where you roll your eyes and you think, Seriously, you're going to get out of the car now. Um, but um, uh, I, what, what I read is, is, is much different. And right now I'm reading um, a Moroccan author, uh, Fouad. I can't remember the last name. But the, the, the title of the book is uh, The Case of Dasukin's Trousers. Oh. <laughs> that sounds really exciting. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, he's, he's uh, Moroccan. He writes in French. And this is a collection of his uh, short stories. It's funny, um, my, my housemates are obsessed with horror movies, so I'm just constantly like walking to the living room and they're just like projecting horror movies and I just like sit down and watch them. I don't know what they are, because I'm not, I don't have like a, I don't have a great knowledge of horror movies, but I, I just walk in and something's playing and I sit down and I watch it. At some point <laughs> they all blend together. Yeah, but I do, I do think there's kind of a connection too between like the visceral quality of like what's happening to bodies in horror movies and that be, I, there's like some connection there between that and like what I want to think about um, in my work. Um, I've, been, I've been trying to research um, some just like literature about friendship and um, in particular like thinking about um, friendship in situ like political situations like what does it mean to for friendships to thrive within like a political scene or like in a lot within a larger collective um, context, because um, I think a lot of literature of friendship is like between like say two individuals. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I want to think about more about what it, how that interacts with like a community or a collective. I actually asked an eight-year-old friend of mine that question because I was also <laughs> looking for literature about friendship, and he told me to read Charlotte's Web. Um, it was really good. And I did, <laughs> but it is actually a really great exploration of friendship. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, does anyone else have any other questions? Thanks. Um, this is for Viet mostly. 
Um, how did you, was it hard to combine such, like so much research about sort of like details about like the medical field and like hard science and like weave those into the interpersonal relationships that you described in the book? Like, d was it your goal to be like, I want to describe like romance and these like horrifying like body scenes in the same book? Um, uh, I guess part of it is um, part of what I wanted to do, especially when look when uh, examining aid workers, was to also look at the way in which we messily try to integrate all these different aspects into of our lives into one being, right? So there's there's you know the uh, the the medical professional, but there's also the the married man and father, and there's also you know the um, the, 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 the gay desire, um, and there's also sort of, you know, sort of the, um, the, um, uh, the, the, you know, relationships with other men that, that we often, that, you know, we try to compartmentalize, but they always start to bleed into each other. And um, that was one of the examinations, is, is how um, these, these categories suddenly become porous, and and we're we're n we're unable to to uh, maintain these these strict boundaries, these these psychological boundaries that um, that that we erect, especially in times of disaster, right? Because uh, when you have a disaster, that's when boundaries are really erased. That's when you're sort of uh, faced with what and who you are at your core as you're trying to survive, right? You, you don't have the mental energy to, to, um, to uh, sort of protect these different parts of yourself when you're trying to protect, you know, your your corporeal being. Hello, this question is from Ken Chen, and he wants to ask, um, <laughs> Viet, why did you decide to set your novel in the context of disaster relief in India? Um, well, as I mentioned, um, I have always been interested in disasters, um, and disasters not in terms of sort of a cataclysmic, um, destructive, earthbound event, but disasters in the sense that um, these are moments where people are forced to choose or forced to change in some way, right? Um, it's, you know, there, there are disasters uh, on the large scale, but there are also, you know, personal intimate disasters that, that everyone sort of has to survive. So it's looking um, and, and, and looking at this, um, the way in which people try to survive, you know, not always successfully, right? Um, even, even in our own personal disasters, sometimes, you know, a little part of us will perish in that. But, you know, the rest of us still has to continue on in some way. Um, so, yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's my ever, that's, that's my love of disasters right there. Um, you know, towering inferno. Um, uh, the Poseidon Adventure, you know, anything where there, where there are people screaming and you have to guess which one is going to make it out at the end. Um, I wanted to ask how the two of you became interested in the idea of friendship within community. Is Were there like experiences that brought you to be to start researching that or like become interested in it? Um, yeah, I, I, I would say personal and political experiences. Um, I, I, especially um, working in sort of feminist context within like a larger political scene, um, often out of necessity, like sometimes there's like incidents of sexual violence um, and you have and that creates rifts within like a larger political context, um, and you have to figure out like politically who are your friends, um, and 
I think those kinds of experiences like taught me how important it is and how much that kind of scenario occurs and um, and it was really important to my political formation um, and I think that's like the root of my interest um, I've also I grew up with a lot of reading a lot of ch children's literature um, about friendship and I miss that I think like as an adult trying to read, read books and not seeing that as much <laughs> um, and wanting like yeah like something beyond like a romantic relationship I mean that's great but um, other kinds of like relating to other people uh, and uh, I think a, a lot of literature of friendship that I've encountered um, there's a lot of like anguish and competition, um, which I think is very real and part of friendship. Um, but I also want, I don't know, I think I, think I crave books that show um, just different facets of friendship and what that could look like, what that could mean in a political context, um, what that could, what are sort of like the pragmatic and political boundaries of friendship. I don't know, I have a lot of questions about it and I, and I <laughs> I don't know, maybe I'm asking literature to do too much to answer some of these questions. <laughs> um, I would 100% agree that I miss literature about friends. And uh, in trying to write it, I'm also having a, just a lot of fun. Um, and I think f for me, it is um, I like the simplicity of the form that friendship is, uh, meaning like as a narrative form, it's two people or not people maybe um, talking about their lives. Um, ultimately, that's a lot of what the churning of friendship is and becomes. Um, so to me, it feels like a very old school, around the fire uh, kind of storytelling style that I think is really fun. Hello. Okay. Um, my question is for Janani. So you asked them how um, they did their research, or how did you do your research? Well, um, I've been reading declassified CIA documents. That's been really fun. Um, reading through a lot of uh, newspapers from the 50s through 80s, just a total trip. Um, really interesting. I also been reading like student newspapers from that time and the remarkable thing is that the language of student newspapers literally hasn't changed. It's just like extremely self-important prose um, <laughs> across time. So I love that. Um, I've been looking at a lot of photos and blueprints. Um, I had to look at a lot of uh, photos of Stanford in the sort of 50s through roughly the 90s in the archives and uh, there's a remarkable number of photos of women's gym classes. So whoever was taking the photos at that time, I don't know, um, that's what they were taking photos of. Uh, and, but there were like gym classes where people were wearing leotards and are in large uh, dance facilities. Uh, yes, yeah, so those are some things, uh, a lot of like uh, scientific documents, books about uh, war in that period, yeah. Research is fun. <laughs> Although it's also easy to fall in uh, the research rabbit hole. Totally. You know, you know as, as you start clicking links, you, you, you get lost and, and you can't find your way back out to, uh, you know, out of, you know, 10 things that show you that your cat is trying to kill you. <laughs> Yes, I read some listicle <laughs> last night about like what are some like human fluids that we don't normally like think of or something. <laughs> what was number one? <laughs> yeah, there were so many. There was like um, bile, right. you know. Um, Lymph. Li yeah, there was there were so many fluids. <laughs> Plasma. Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> I mean, the human body is, is what ninety something percent water, so. There's a lot to ring out there. Yeah. <laughs> oh my. <laughs> I, I wanted to follow up on the conversation about friendship. Um, so it's a question for all of you. But uh, the, I hear you talking about friendship in this loving sort of way. 
uh, friendship without competition, friendship without jealousy, et cetera. And so I wanted to get a sense from all of you what politically we can learn, especially for Oki, what politically we can learn from friendship. Uh, uh, again, based on this the conversation that I've heard, which is friendship without the competition, friendship without jealousy, um, friendship in, in all the senses of love um, that the Greeks uh, wrote about. So if you can comment on that, I'd appreciate it. Thanks. Um, well, I think one of the things I think about is like, for the end of capitalism to happen, like we need to remake all human relations. So, and but there's like not very good models for that <laughs> out there in the world, <laughs> um, since we live under capitalism and our all our relations are sort of organized that way and it and um, structured that way. So, um, I and I you know as much as like it's just it's hard to look for those utopian ideals. Um, I also I. You know, we all need models um, and things to look at. So I think friendship, with all its faults, and and definitely like it, in in my personal life, and I'm sure everyone's like, there's a lot of messy friendships um, and a lot of hurt and things like that. But um, I also want to think about friendship as um, the maybe the beginning kernel of like thinking about like what could relationality between people. Um, look like um, if we are trying to think um, against capitalism and capitalist um, relationships? Um, for me, you know, f uh, friendships, I've always conceived of friendships, you know, even though there are those, those wonderful, beautiful, positive things, you know, I think that, you know, as humans, we're we will never actually be able to escape all the negative things too, right? Because as much as I love and cherish and, and care for my friends, you know, I can, I can also be, be ridiculously jealous and petty and, you know, and, you know, sometimes want to slap them. Um, but, you know, that's, that's, that's part of uh, what you do as friends, right? You know, um, you know you're, you're in that privileged place where you can call someone an asshole. Okay, um, so what I see friendships can do politically is I think that um, one of the problems that we, we encounter uh, politically is, is this idea of this lack of empathy, right? This lack of understanding or, or, or seeing from another's point of view. But this is something that friendship does develop, right? Is it develops empathy, you know, you, not only do you care for your friend, but you also understand your friend, and you can understand your friend, you know, even when they do something shitty, right? And and it's this um, empathy that I think is um, that can that drives something political. If you can empathize with someone who is not you and your friend, you can also possibly, I would hope, empathize with a complete stranger um, who you don't know, but you can say. Um, you know, I've got a pal who's just like you, and he's a shithead too. I think uh, the thing that I like to learn and take from friendship is uh, just the simple idea of existing side by side um, across time. And I feel like there is something really ambitious about that applied at a very large scale. Hello, this is my own question. Um, so I think all the bits that you read from your works today, all of them have played with scale in a way that I thought was really interesting. So some of you guys are talking about even down to like cells. And, and then I think with aid work, that seems like a really, um, I don't know what the other opposite of minute is, but a really like enlarged picture to the point where like an aid worker finds it difficult to even relate to a person as a person because they have to see it in such a big picture. Um, so I'm, I guess my question is how do you guys as doing your work, um, 
how do you play with that scale? If you do, do you think about that as an aspect of your work, as a specific aspect of your work, and how do you utilize it if you do? Okay, so for me, um, when I think about the scale, um, part of what I have to conceive of is, you know, this idea of what, um, what I want the story to encompass, right? So, you know, with uh, the earthquake, you know, there are so many different elements and, and, um, and facets that go into sort of rescue work that I knew that, you know, with this huge dis disaster, you do have to start breaking it down and, and, and examining, you know, sort of smaller, um, smaller cells, as you will, right? Um, you know, the, the medical response, um, the search and rescue response, sort of logistical um, ideas. So it's, um, yeah, I guess it's, it's looking at both sort of big pictures and then, you know, trying to distill those down into, um, you know, into individuals. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's boiling down that big pot until you have um, a delicious syrup. Um, I think part of the, the scale question um, is an important question for me because I'm working within the genre of sci-fi um, or speculative fiction. Um, and I think that's a genre that sort of begs questions of scale. Um, you, you have to think about how, the basic question, I think, of like how do things work um, or what's the world that this is occurring in. Um, so you have to do a certain amount of world building and, um, and think, or thinking about that at least for yourself um, and um, convey that to your reader. Um, and and, as, and because my book has to do with time travel, but the time travel is a disease, or it's felt, it's right, it's very much felt in the body on a small and minuscule scale. Um, so I, I, I was like sort of playing and thinking about that a lot throughout and sort of going between um, these modes of between, between the body and then this kind of like massive, um, scale like insect <laughs> invasion <laughs> and how that's linked up, how those things are, you, ca you can't really um, extricate them from each other. Um, and I, I think that's an interesting way to think about the world as well, that like ev all, all the people and elements are, can't really be um, delinked. Um, there aren't just like individuals alienated from each other, but like that they're, they're all, the, the fates of everyone are sort of like tied together. Hello again. Um, so working with sci-fi, how do you make the science like, how do you balance the science with, like, the fiction? Like, how do you make it so, like, the um, like the hard science isn't too difficult to understand to make it, like, distracting from reading, like, the story? Um, I don't know. I have a hard time in my mind actually prying apart science and science fiction. Like, to me, I feel like I experience science as a story, and so I try to tell it as one. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I'm not. Uh, I'm not. I don't have a science background, so I have to explain things to myself <laughs> before I can explain to someone else. Um, and it and it is more. Um, there's not that much hard science in my sci-fi. It's more of like we encounter science and technology all the time. I don't understand how my phone works really, but um, I have to interact with it constantly. Or like I understand being surveilled. I don't know how it all works. Um, so we interact, interact with it enough that I think that there is some kind of residual knowledge of like what that feels like, even if I don't understand every aspect of how it works. So I, I think that's sort of more at what I use um, that experience um, more than my hard science knowledge. <laughs>
Jumping off of the question of scale, I'm wondering how power is related in um, thinking about friendship and like being side by side or like coexisting without that jealousy, but like in that utopian fantasy, but in reality there's, I, I think that that concept is usually there. So question for all of you, I guess. Yeah, I think um, power exists in relationships. Um, and I think what the desire that I have to speak about friendship is not to ignore that, but um, I think if you say what you want, like if you're like, this is the kind of friendship that I would like to encourage and want to see and um, strive for in my life, and also like I want to see how that works with characters in fiction. Um, or that's a kind of political ideal. I think that that actually brings forward some of the power imbalances that do exist or like some of those struggles um, rather than push it back. Um, because like we can see the discrepancy between like that desire and what actually happens. Um, and, I, and I think that that's also important to describe um, those kinds of power dynamics. Um, I think in a political situation, right, people often strive to um, work together in a way that like breaks down a lot of those hierarchies. Um, whether they're the, the successful or not is another question, um, and one that often has kind of um, interest. Like there, it's almost an experiment. I think that's how I think about friendship, and often like a lot of political projects as well. It's an experiment in trying to be together and then trying to sort of break down those hierarchies. Um, and of course, like experiments often require and um, result in failure. Um, but I think, again, like that failure shows you like what you need to work on. Um, in just sort of thinking about this relationship between power and friendship, right? You know, it, it's true that there always will be certain power imbalances in friendships. Um, but I think that the counterpoint to that power or sort of the, the mitigating factor in, in that sort of power imbalance is also this issue of trust, right? Um, because when you think of friends, you know, uh, when you tell a friend a secret, you are giving that friend power over you, possibly, right? To, you know, you're saying, this is something that can hurt me. Um, you have that power to hurt me. But you're also, you know, giving that with the sense of trust, right? You have this power to hurt me, but we're going to balance that with, I'm going to trust you not to do that. So there's, um, I think, trust is probably the, the, the flip side of this idea of power. At least in my mind, as to my friendships. I guess to me, it's a. It feels like such a complicated thing, uh, that I really um, gravitate to stories as the place to grapple with how complicated it is, um, because they feel like a container that can actually hold it. Uh, when like the, a narrative is a container that can actually hold. Uh, all the dynamics that exist in a particular relationship. Although I will say as authors, you should not trust us with any of your secrets. <laughs> it's true. Hi, um, I had a question mostly for Oki about um, how, but it could also be for everyone, just about kind of how your aesthetics are related to how you think about the major themes in that, that you're all dealing with, whether it's disaster or friendship, or um, especially in Oki's case, I wanted to ask about kind of bodies and violence. 
because um, I was very struck by the the kind of um, this like living, uh, suffocating, like lumpy atmosphere. Uh, <laughs> and I just I just wanted to know more about like where that aesthetics comes from and how it's related to um, your work in China. Hmm. Um, I'm usually a poet, although that's maybe kind of less true. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think a lot of my style and sort of like, um, cer yeah, certain formal things that I do in writing fiction are borrowed from poetry. Um, so there's a lot of, the, re the repetition I think kind of helps like create that kind of suffocating <laughs> atmosphere. <laughs> um, lumpiness, gooiness, I don't know where that comes from. I, I think that I discovered <laughs> reading one of my own poems <laughs> that um, that was about like, I think it was like, just like about, about food textures or something. And I realized that like, I was like, oh, like a lot of the foods I grew up eating are very lumpy and gooey. <laughs> or just like, you know, a lot of the, thing, the kind of thing that um, someone who's a little bit picky about food will be like, oh, I have a textural problem with that. Um, and I'm like, oh, the, I love all the textural problems. Um, <laughs> that's all I live for. Uh, <laughs> uh, so maybe that's where it's like, yeah, it all kind of comes down to certain base things like that. Like, yeah, like foods that I literally put into my mouth. Um, and then that's like a really visceral memory that I have forever. Um, for me, I think when I think of aesthetics and trying to achieve a certain aesthetic, for me, that is sort of, inextricable from thinking about um, effect, right? What sort of effect do you want your readers to take away from this? Or, you know, what, whether it's an emotional effect, whether it's a textual effect, you know? Um, and I think um, the aesthetics are shaped around that, right? You, 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 you have this idea in your head, I want my readers to feel um, slimy, okay? So, so you craft your, your, your language around that that concept of, of sliminess, and and you craft your, um, your 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 rhythms and your patterns around around slime, um, as as you should. Do writers, and this, I guess this is for all of you, um, do you always write with such instrumentality in, in mind that you want to create in the reader's mind a particular experience as opposed to telling the narrative? So in other words, what's driving it? Because Viet, you just made it sound like you are deliberately manipulating the reader and that's what you want people to get from your reading as opposed to, <clears throat> pardon me, um, some sort of emotive or deeply psychological experience from reading about this earthquake and its after effects. And Oki too, uh, like whether, I mean, the, your line about the cicadas really just, wow, language changes, changes us, right? It's very transformative. And so here you attach this name that sounds very scientific and it alters your perception. Um, and that sounded like kind of the opposite of what Viet was saying, where you're allowing the the narrative to drive the story as opposed to your intention as an author. Sorry, that was just a rant. Hopefully it wasn't a rambling thought, but I think a response. Um, I, I do both. Um, I write very emotionally and I have an emotional relationship to language. Um, I'm sure we writers all do, I don't know. Um, and uh, yeah, I think a lot of like that passage you're talking about, like is partially drawn to from like just thinking about like my emotional like relationship to language including like learning English and what and like the residue of that and um, like what sliding between languages feels like and the um, the different kind of emotional connotations of different words as you're as you're learning and sort of flipping back between um, languages um, 
and yeah, that's that's definitely part of it. Um, being sort of immersed in in writing and feelings <laughs> as I'm writing. Uh, there's also yeah, I, I do also plan out um, outline and plan out what I want to do. Um, it's a combination of sort of both modes, I think. Um, so for me, I guess my answer is going to be um, slightly different um, in that um, even though in my head this is how I conceive of the world and this is sort of how I want the world to feel, um, one of the great pleasures of being an author is that you don't have to be there when someone else is reading your work, right? And um, the fact of the matter is, as much as I might intend, as, my, as much as I might want to try to steer the, the reader in a certain direction, they are going to go in whatever direction they want, right? So, um, you know, and I think that that's part of the pleasure of reading is that you can interpret the author's words in your own way. Um, in spite of what the author might have been trying to do. So, um, so yeah, there's, there's intentionality on our part, but essentially, once we give it over to you, um, that intentionality sort of disappears. Um, and it's, it's now up to, to you to either, um, you know, if you want to go in that direction, you can, but if you want to go off in your own direction, um, you know, uh, that's perfectly okay too. Okay, I have a question for you. What's your favorite bug? Uh, so hard. <laughs> so many good bugs. <laughs> um, uh, I really like those, have you seen those praying mantises that look like flowers? They're very beautiful. They're pink. Um, I don't know if that's my favorite. That's just the first one that popped into my head. <laughs> Um, but there's so many good ones. <laughs> Do you have a favorite? I don't know if I have a favorite either, but the first one that pops into my mind are the those big, huge tree roaches that, you know, um, <laughs> that, that land and you think a dinner plate has just <laughs> fallen at your feet. Um, and, and the reason that happens to be my favorite is, is because of a, a, an odd connection that, you know, I, I had a cat who would like to, like, bat around those tree roaches until they left, you know, little antenna and legs all over the place. <laughs> and then he would go back and methodically eat each piece, right, after he had dismembered this tree roach. So um, I guess my, that's why it's my favorite, is, is my pleasure in seeing my cat eat the roach. There should be a horror movie about your cat. <laughs> it's actually a love story. Actually, just like going off of that, like the love story versus horror story, um, I'm interested in like hearing about what you guys think about like the like kind of the place of the disaster as as like that like the, the the radical other that fucks with you, right? Like the place where like a disaster is kind of low key anything that just doesn't care about you um, that is happening in close enough uh, proximity or in high enough intensity to affect you, um, and how you think of like that that aspect of disaster, like disaster as just just other like just otherness right like near you like radical otherness near you um, and whether you try to incorporate that into like uh, your characterization like you know the things that are understandable about writing um, or understandable about like a plot versus like keep just keep maintaining that otherness outside as like a backdrop or a setting or like a theme, a thesis, you know, something a little bit more abstract. Like, how do you incorporate the otherness of the disaster, like the real disaster, um, into your fictional disaster? So, uh, it, it, the way I sort of think about it is that, you know, 
Right. Disasters are this um, are this are this huge dark force that suddenly enters your life. Um, but in in writing about disasters, it's it's for me. I wanted to see how people respond to it, right? It's, it's, it's not just the disaster, but how uh, your relationship with the disaster and how you answer it or how you, um, you know, it's, it's what do you do when you hear that knock on your door? Do you answer the door? Do you go hide under the bed? You know, do you jump out the back window? You know, it's, it's those are the options we have um, when we're confronted to a disaster and it's seeing um, what these individuals um, do in the face of, of what's come in front of them. Um, there's a scene in the, in the novel where the protagonist is attacked by a, a large military bug. Spoiler, sorry. Um, <laughs> and, and it's a part where the prose really breaks apart and is just like totally fragmented um, it's not totally clear, clear what's going, out, go, going on, except there's like this kind of negative force against her body, um, which totally breaks apart language. Um, and at the same time, it's a bug, which, um, you know, as you know, um, she has a very deep and intimate connection to bugs. Um, but it's, it's also this like military technology um, that that mimics this form that that she is like connected to, um, and yeah. So I think this question is is basically like one of the central questions that I tried to think about, and it is really hard to incorporate into um, into a plot. I think it becomes a kind of like silent character in the book um, that sort of tries to destroy everything all the time. And um, the aftermath is like, is basically like, how do they survive that? How do they reform their relationships to each other in the face of knowing something like that is possible? Um, like, how do they just have like regular like friendship, like talking around the fire, um, protect, trying to protect each other? Um, and it's it's like my I think it's my favorite scene in the, in the book where um, I think one of her friends like gives her like a pair of boots and is like here like put these on and like they'll protect you and there's something like kind of magical about like that kind of gift I think of that gesture that is about like reforming a sense of um, yeah relationality like post disaster that I think is really important um, to do all the time. But yeah, the I do think it's not, it's also not just like negative. I think the disaster takes on kind of interesting and intricate like characteristics. Um, like I, w I wanna think more about that, but like the, the that kind of ne extreme like negative force of the event um, I think is like brutal, but that doesn't always mean that it's simple. Like, it could be very baroque. I don't know. <laughs> What's your favorite color? Uh, pink. No, blue. Um, um, I like maroon. I really like sapphire, like deep blue. I think that I, I used to have, my room used to be painted like deep space blue. I think that's what it was called. Um, but now it's, now I painted a color called peaches and cream. <laughs> so <laughs> maybe that's my favorite color now. <laughs> Have you thought about doing an ombre? Maybe start with peaches and cream and have it fade into deep space blue? I think my room would have to be a lot bigger. <laughs> like 70 foot ceilings. Bear with me if it doesn't make sense. Um, 
So I think I was really called to um, just the name of this gathering. And um, it's been on my mind kind of both the material reality and like kind of this conceptual idea of disposable bodies. Um, I don't know why I'm getting emotional. <laughs> um, both um, that happen in natural disasters and um, whether it's like state sanctioned violence or interpersonal relationships and so forth. Um, and especially with a lot of, um, you know, people of color, indigenous people, black and brown bodies. And so um, for me, uh, I guess the, my question is with um, parts like hearing, hearing parts of your work, um, very, very, like you said, very visceral images. Um, has this helped in any way to deal with trauma or any sort of violence? Or the, the writing process or um, in what ways maybe you do personally deal with trauma? Um, I think that, you know, it is the process of storytelling that helps us deal not only with with trauma but you know any sort of um, you know emotion we feel right because this is um, yeah this is this is what we do when we try to heal we, we tell other people what has happened we we, we um, and this is how we process we, we think about it um, and hopefully, in the sharing of that story, um, we begin to start a new story, right? We, we've told this story, and now hopefully we can write um, the story of what happens next in our lives. I I feel that reading helps me sometimes. Um, and I'm not sure if that was why I, I wrote this, um, but I do think that um, there was definitely processing of trauma and just and just dealing with like thinking about the the deeply alienating effects of um, just even reading the news, you know, or just like what happens every day. Um, in this world, so yeah, and, and which is impossible to process in a way, um, and certainly like in the form of a book, it's not necessarily possible. Um, that's something that I think that we all have to do together, all the time. Um, but maybe it, it is like just like a small attempt to process some of my own stuff, um, and like thinking about like yeah relationships that. I've had with people um, or political situations um, where we tried to have some kind of collective response to what was happening, uh, and yeah, and putting putting those ideas into like a, a future where things continue to be really fucked up, um, right? This uh, dystopian landscape, uh, which I think. I started writing this like a few years ago and I think like now reading it, it feels like less dystopian in the sense of like, it's like far in the future and like this total exaggeration of the present. It feels much more just like the present. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's, it's like, it's hard to write that. Um, and it's hard to feel like you're doing it right, I think because it is grappling with all the things that you feel terrible about and um, and then also like the, the sort of like hope you're, you're trying to inject or the, or the kind of like political solutions or like desire for something more that you're trying to put in there. Um, 
often, and, and I think the characters kind of feel this too sometimes, is like, doesn't always feel like enough, or it feels like the situation feels really, it, it's hard to feel powerful. Um, and, but I think some, something about writing that, um, yeah, has, has been helpful to me, and I, I don't know what the reader would take away from it. Um, but I, I think one of the th cool things about uh, being a, a writer who uh, is not at all famous um, is that mostly, the, mostly when you write a book like this, I think most of the time you're just like talking to people that are like this, right? Um, and I, I'm really interested in like what those conversations could feel like and what they could do. Um, I don't know what they could do, but I think that's like what's interesting about like writing a book that you, I mean, yeah, you do hand off the book to the audience, to the reader, but you know, you do readings and you interact with people afterwards and um, like via correspondence or whatever. Um, and I think that's kind of like an interesting way to relate to people. Yeah, I think there's a there's a there's a power in 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 telling stories and also collective storytelling, right? Um, just thinking about the whole sort of Me Too hashtag, right? It was it was one story, and then people added to that story, and from the 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 power of all those stories together, you know, some sort of action and some sort of change has begun. Right, you know, obviously there's there's a lot more that needs to be done, but it 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 was the um, it was the one story and then the other stories that came forth from it that I think um, has has um, started um, this movement, right? And and I, that's part of what you know you know um, we're here at the writers' workshop for, right? We tell our story, and hopefully that'll encourage others to tell their stories, and you know. It it uh, it becomes this sort of uh, this beautiful Ponzi scheme of, of of storytelling, where in the end, you know, everyone gets rich and wins. <laughs> I think that's our last question. Thank you, everybody. Thank you to Oki and Via being here.